Awesome. I am here with John Doherty of Credo. John, why don't you uh, start by just telling us about yourself and Credo? Ryan, what's up, man? Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So um, yeah, John Doherty, founder and CEO of Credo. Um, we're a two-sided business in the digital marketing space, uh, basically connecting up businesses that are looking to hire digital marketing firms with digital marketing firms that we have vetted out. Um, so I've, uh, I started the company in 2013, started working on it full-time in 2015. Um, so it's been about five years now, a couple months shy of five years. Um, actually, in two months from now, it'll be five years exactly. Um, and uh, so I, I have a, a long history in SEO and digital marketing. Um, started off my first uh, first job, SEO job was in Philly, working for uh, Philadelphia um, from the East Coast originally, live in different Colorado now, but was a, a link builder um, in the for-profit education space, moved on to Distilled in New York City, um, and worked with a um, bunch of awesome clients doing SEO consulting and, and that sort of thing. Um, before I got into SEO, I was trained as a web developer, content writer, et cetera, did some customer support stuff, did some sales stuff. Um, so kind of a, a varied background there, lived in Europe for a couple years, um, and then went in-house after Distilled, uh, went in-house with Zillow, ran marketing, SEO. SEO marketing digital growth for uh, hotpads.com, which is the rental site that they had acquired about a year before, and then Trulia Rentals once uh, once Zillow Group acquired Trulia. Um, and then I got laid off and decided to work uh, for myself, and I haven't looked back. Um, so over the last five years, really four, four and a half years, we've helped over 4,500 companies that are looking to hire. Um, I've worked with over 350 agencies and consultants myself um, and made agencies and consultants over $10 million, probably more like $15 million now. Um, and yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun challenge. Challenge. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of moving parts in the business, but have a great team, um, you know, CTO, uh, ops, um, finance, all that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, so I, I spend most of my days thinking about how do we, you know, reach the right people um, that are looking to hire? How do we, you know, kind of identify when they're ready to hire? How do we help them hire? Um, and then how do we help agencies deliver great, how do we help agencies sell better work and then, you know, keep delivering great work? Because um, the easiest people to sell to are people that are already your customers. So I think about that a lot. Nice. So you guys have basically two part two parts that you have to manage, right? Getting agencies and then also getting companies who want to hire an agency. Uh, let's start by talking about the agency process. So, um, is it like an application process? Do you vet how? How? how like, how does somebody be, get in as an agency get into the Credo? I guess databases is, is. Is I'm not sure if that's the right term, but how does somebody get in with Credo? Yeah, sure. So, so Credo is an interesting business in that, as you said, we have the two sides. We have the demand side and the supply side. So the demand side is companies looking to hire. And as we're able to acquire, as we're able to acquire that side, then we're able to bring new people, new agencies into the network. So I don't want to sell people on something that I can't deliver on. Right. And so it's constantly finding the engines that work for generating leads and qualifying them and getting them into the system and, and all of that. Um, so when we have openings, so basically all of our, we, we determine who we can bring on based off of our, our pipeline, right? The pipeline that we, the sales pipeline that we have generated. So we actually apply a value to every project that comes in. We verify their budget and then say like, you know, say it's a, an S project and they're spending between 2,500 and five grand a month on marketing, right? We know from our legacy data that they're going to sign for about $2,000 a month. It's going to be somewhere between 1,500 and three grand. They're probably not going to go above three grand. They're probably not going to go under 1,500 unless they're like dramatically under, they're sold something for less than what they should be paying for that same, for that service, um, which I see all too often, by the way. Um, and so that's, that's one of my, one of my things is like, charge what you're worth, right? And we can talk about pricing and, and you know, actually charging for your worth if you want to. Um, and so basically on the agency side, once you're able to bring them in, so get credo.com slash pros, P-R-O-S kind of shows you the different like models, levels that we have. Um, so basically right now we're asking everybody to just join the wait list. Um, and so you tell us a little bit about yourself, you join the wait list. And then as we have openings, we're basically going to open up those openings, reach out to people that are fit for that, right? So say we have a need for SEO for e-commerce or, or, or SEO and PPC for e-commerce, we'll go find all the e-commerce agencies um, and invite, you know, invite the ones that, that look like the right fit. Um, and, uh, how, and, then, how, and then the vetting is, is three steps. It's uh, results, professionalism, and culture. So results, you tell us a couple of your clients, the project that you did for them, the results you got for them. And then you also give us your point of context, uh, contact information. So we get in touch with them. Would they recommend that they work with you? Um, uh, professionalism, we look at um, uh, your reporting. We look at uh, the, the uh, deliverables that you send, all that sort of thing. I mean, just kind of looking for like grammar, that sort of stuff. We're not spot checking your work. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if I look at a, an SEO deliverable and you're talking about buying links, probably not going to bring you into Credo. Uh, we're not going to bring you into Credo. Um, so, you know, so some of that stuff that we look at. And then culture, we actually do a call with everybody that we're uh, actively referring work to just to get to know them. We really think about the agencies that we're sending work to as partners um, and like to get to know them. What are they look? What are they looking for? What's going on in their business? That kind of thing. Um, and uh, you know, we, we're we're in it for the long haul. 
So, so it's, it's, it's a very hands-on model then, right? So it's not like a clutch where I yeah. could just go up, sign up for a profile, get some ratings or reviews, game the algo type vibe. Pay no, for some no, not, not at all. We've purposefully stayed away from that. I, I really respect clutch and up city and those companies and what they're doing there. Um, they're very much the directory model, right? They're, they're a mass like media directory advertising model. Our model was very different. Um, purposefully kind of a, a productized service. Um, uh, yeah, because it's, it's, it just meets a different need in the market. You know, if someone wants to go and they want to browse a hundred profiles and read some reviews and contact 50 people and have all these conversations, go for it. But if you're a, direct, a busy director of marketing that you're looking to find the right SEO agency for your, you know, e-commerce store that's doing 5 million a year and you want to grow to 15 and you don't have time to go be vetting that, you know, talk to 50 agencies and narrow it down to 15 and get 10 proposals, we're the right fit for, for those. So it so, sounds almost somewhat like, uh, like how I, as a hiring manager, might use a, a recruiting company in a sense. Um, yeah. and, and how does, how does your, how does your revenue model work? Do you charge the agencies or is it free to be a part of uh, the credo or do you charge the e-commerce company looking for an agency? Yeah. So it's, it's free to the, to the demand side, to the e-commerce company that's hiring. Um, oh. and on the agency side, we basically have levels of, uh, sales pipeline. So how much sales pipeline do you want per month? So the bottom level is I think 1299 a month is what we have there on the site. And so it's two to three qualified leads. So it's not just like, here's some contact information. Good luck. Right. But we've, we've actually talked to them. They, they showed up to a call. We talked to them. We've gotten them into the system. We verified their information. And then we're actually scheduling that, uh, that, uh, that client or that prospect with the agencies from within our network that are a good fit from, you know, based off of um, what, what they tell us about their project. And then we have some internal tooling for matching and that sort of stuff. Um, uh, yeah. So, so, it, so basically agencies are paying us per month for, you know, however much, uh, you know, potential work they want to get on their schedule on their calendars. Um, so these aren't like leads, right? I actually hate the word leads because like what the F is a lead, right? Is mm -hmm. someone look to spend 20 bucks a month on SEO or someone look to spend 20 grand? They're both leads technically, but they're very different values. Um, and so we're, so we, we very much try to, to talk about the, the business side of this um, and not just like marketers looking for leads. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a very different thing from like an Upwork. And once I respect Upwork, I just hired someone from Upwork this morning to help me out with some lead generation stuff. Um, but you know, we're, we're a different, we're a different fit there. We've talked about the like success fee on the, the client hiring side, but honestly, we don't want to do anything that's going to keep agencies from signing more work, right? I don't want someone to not sign with an agency that we connect them up with because they're going to have to pay us two grand because, you know, we saved them a bunch of time. Um, we tested that sort of stuff in the past and this is the model we've settled on and the business does just fine. We do, we do very well. Um, and so there's uh, no read upset set that. Yeah. No I feel like that gives, that. I feel like that gives you one less thing to worry about too. Right. Because mm -hmm. balancing then, I mean, so first of all, if I'm an e-commerce company, I'm going to be essentially you're getting a lead from me as an e-commerce company is going to be much easier because it's, it's risk-free, right? Uh, right. I come to you, I don't have to pay. Um, you know, after I have a conversation with, I trust you a lot more. So it's basically going to build your uh, demand gen side a lot more than you can just focus more on the quality of the agencies, which really what it is what it is, right? This is all hinges on the ability to get agencies who can deliver on what they're promising. So you got it. As, as you're kind of going through the agency interviewing process, let's say, uh, you know, I'm a smaller agency, meaning, um, you know, my average retainer is like 3k a month. If an yeah. e but I do e-commerce, right? Um, you get to know me, you like us, we, we meet your three criteria. Would you not match me with a, a client budget that came in at like 10,000? Um, and would you pass that to somebody else? Even though if I felt like I was trying to level up. So do you match also on, on, on kind of like past retainer and, and, and budget amount based on the agency or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, and, and, and the, you know, anyone really over like look to spend over 10 K a month on, you know, the specific channel, we kind of reserve those for a, our best agencies. I've worked with us for a long time because we trust them, yeah. right? We know them, we trust them. We know they'll deliver. We know that they can close. I've had, I had people in the past, this is probably 2016, 2017. Um, so learned a lot since then, but people would come in, they're like, yeah, my average client is like 1500 bucks a month, but I only want to talk to people that are looking to spend five. And at that time I was like, okay, let's give it a shot. Right. And they couldn't close and they'd churn out. Right. And then they'd blame it on me. And I'm like, no, you can't F and close. Right. Like you don't know how to close a 5k a month deal. It's a very different thing from a $1,500 a month deal. Right. Like 1500 bucks a month for SEO services versus five grand a month for SEO strategy, you know, fulfillment, consulting, et cetera, two completely different projects. So, right. um, yeah, so, so we do kind of base it off of that and learn like kind of what is the agency's ideal, ideal client was their average client look like, um, and kind of, uh, kind of optimize towards that. We will give them a crack at some like, you know, 
if, if they have, you know, room in their pipeline, we haven't filled them up for that month. And, you know, a, a bigger fish comes through and we're like, all right, you know, give it, give it a go. Um, yeah. You know, and if we learn that you can close them, you know, and, and you're, you know, you're closing a lot of work and you want more leads, et cetera, we can move you up to the next level and start sending you bigger fish. That's no problem. So, so you mentioned can't close a few times. Is that why um, you have a sales training also for agencies? I've, I've seen you promoting it in the past. Is that why you developed the sales training? Is it more, was it, was it a, was it a revenue model for the company or was it more kind of to help the agencies that you have to just perform better within your platform? It was both, honestly. Um, I mean, it, you know, it, I was charging a grand basically for it. It was five, five weeks of live instruction plus a live week of Q and a, um, I was charging basically a grand, a, a, a seat, but you know, an agency could have multiple people come to it. Right. And still pay the same amount. Um, and I basically built that because I've been being asked so much on podcasts on, you know, by agencies, that kind of thing, training agencies one-on-one, -on -one, just like our best partners being like, Hey, let's overhaul your, like your sales process here. And we were, uh, we, regularly see a 15 to 25% increase in their close rates, um, which just adds up to a lot of dollars over the years. Um, and so I was like, I want to democratize this information. So I started teaching it, built out the curriculum, started teaching it. I've actually been working over the last couple of weeks to record all of those. And then I'm actually going to launch it as like a, a product. Um, so, you know, people can just pay for that. So you don't have to be part of Credo to get that training. You can just pay mm -hmm. us for that training, go through it at your own pace, that kind of thing. And I built it because we were seeing agencies that do phenomenal work and, and they just weren't closing. Um, and, and honestly, at the time, our business model was built more off of how well the agency closed and then retained work. And so we wanted to do whatever we could to help them close. Now it's like, hey, if you're, you know, you're getting good leads from us and you're not closing, we know that you're going to turn out, which is bad for our business. So you know, if, you're, if, you're not, if not being able to close is your main challenge, you can deliver, you can drive great results, and you just need to learn how to close we can help you learn how to close. Um, gotcha. I have sales training from back in the day and I've sold a lot of consulting work myself. So uh, gotcha. I, I kind of take the process that I know that works and have, have made it uh, to work for other people. So, so does your training get into lead generation as well or is it mainly focused on the sales process, the consultation, the conversations, et cetera? Yeah, we do talk about lead generation, um, kind of the different channels that, that work. One thing that I um, that I see marketers doing is, I mean, I, I know you've seen this, but you're very much like a, a process guide. These are the things that work, but a lot of people are just like kind of, kind of scatterbrained, right? Squirrel. Mm -hmm. Like what, what's that over there? They're like, Oh, let's try Facebook ads. Let's try Instagram ads. Let's try SEO. Let's try content. And I'm like, freaking focus, please. <laughs> um, right. Like so many people it's, it's indigestion. It's, you know, I think it's Darmesh uh, shop from HubSpot that said that like companies don't die. It, companies die because of indigestion. Um, so you just don't know where you're, where you're going. So, uh, what I like to do is, is help people focus and say like, these are the funnels that work SEO and content paid acquisition and content, you know, referrals. I also talk about a lead generation ladder where, you know, people come in and they're like, I want to get leads from credo. I'm like, what are you currently doing? They're like, Oh, I just went out on my own last week. I'm like, okay, you're not ready. Mm -hmm. uh, um, especially on old models where we are cheaper, you know, different kind of, uh, um, uh, yeah, in different incentives. Gotcha. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah. So, so we do, we do talk about that by talking about the lead generation ladder referrals, your own properties, your, your paid acquisition. And then finally accelerants like Credo or clutch or, or any of those, there's no harm in being on those. Like even when you're just starting, mm -hmm. you're just not going to get much from it. Right. For sure. um, can't, can't expect much from it. Um, especially if you don't, if you haven't learned how to close direct referrals and then people coldly kind of warm leads coming in through your own site, acquiring them through paid and then closing those in the clients. Like ours is another level because it's another level removed and another like, like not quite as warm as, you know, either of those, honestly. Um, gotcha. So you kind of have to learn how to close those before you can really close the, the type that are coming from a, a service like Credo. So, so with everything that's going on right now with COVID and, and just our country just being what it is right now, um, things have definitely, you know, I, I just like yourself talk to a lot of agencies. I also have an agency, so I'm, I'm very in touch with everything. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the feedback that we're getting from, from, from blueprint members is that, you know, they're able to maintain their current clients. Um, but revenue has been stagnating just because of the fact that leads have really dried up. Right. I mean, the first thing to go when there's any sort of downturn, in the economy is always going to be contractors, agencies, just easy yep. to fire. Um, yep. do you have any tips for people for how to get leads right now? It would mainly, I'm assuming be from cold traffic, but I don't want to put that. In. I mean, what would you tell agencies right now in terms of how they can get some leads right now and going forward? Yeah. So I've seen, I've seen a couple of things. Um, what we saw was we, we said, I sit in kind of an interesting perspective in the industry. Um, and what we saw was, you know, we had a pretty full pipeline agencies that we'd sent work to had a pretty full pipelines. And then like March 13th to 17th, all of that evaporated. 
gone, poof. Like people that were currently about to pull the trigger, just gone. And then like some clients turning out, agencies that were heavy in travel and those sorts of industries just lost. I saw agencies losing 30, 50% of their revenue overnight. Um, so, but then on the flip side, what we've also seen, obviously with all the things going on with the economy is uh, teams getting kind of trimmed back and, and uh, people getting laid off. And usually that's, you know, clearing up just like, uh, you know, monthly overhead, that kind of thing, benefits, all that sort of stuff. It just adds up. Um, if, you, if you don't own a business, you probably don't see that. But like as a business owner, you know, there are a lot of other costs to having employees, as you well know, as probably people watching this well know. Um, and so what we've seen is people trimming back uh, their teams, but they still need to get the things done. They, they, you know, they let go of their SEO manager and now their digital marketing manager is doing it all, but their digital marketing manager is an SEO expert. So they're going to go and hire an agency for less per month than they were paying their SEO manager, right? So like they still get things done and it's cheaper. Um, so I think that's actually one way to lean into it um, is not necessarily leaning on the cheaper part, but on the, you know, we can, you, you can basically hire a whole, you know, SEO team for what you're, you know, paying your, your SEO manager before that you had to let go. Um, so I, I think that that's one way to do it. I, it comes down a lot to shifting of messaging. I haven't really seen a change in, in search volume for things like, you know, information. If anything, I've seen a bump for information about, you know, like how to do SEO, how to run paid ads, right? How to get a better, you know, better CPC, better ROAS, like that sort of stuff. So I think now it's leaning into the fact that, um, and, and this is hard for Mark, for a lot of digital marketers that haven't been super like data focused, but, um, but for those that have been data focused, um, and, and you're able to help people understand this is how you get, identify your wasted Facebook spend, right? This is how you scale your accounts profitably or, you know, on the SEO side, here's how you determine what content's working, what's not. Um, and, uh, you know, where, where the opportunity is, how to open up new markets, you know, with keyword research, link building, that sort of stuff. People are like, oh, well, that's, that's fascinating. They've moved from the like FOMO, my competitors are investing in this, so I need to invest in it, right? Even if I'm not fully convinced that it's going to work, I'm going to invest a little bit of money in there, right? To kind of try it out people. Those people are gone. Now you're getting the people that they're like, this is a way that we know that we can grow our business. It's been working for us. And so let's double down on it. Um, they're going to be better clients as well. So, you know, I would say <clears throat> there aren't as many quote unquote leads out there, but I think we've mainly just gotten rid of the tire kickers which I think is a, actually a really good thing. And then you need to show them this is how you need to get very focused on business and how this is how you can maintain and even accelerate out of this downturn, um, you know, uh, um, well and profitably. Mm -hmm. Actually, just, just piggybacking off that, um, somebody just asked, they, they've been, you know, obviously getting fewer leads now uh, with everything that's going on in COVID. Um, they're going through the consultation process. They're sending proposals. Everything seems to be good. The mm -hmm. prospect seems to be interested. They seem to be engaged. Um, they're requesting the proposal. They're requesting to move forward, um, but they're ghosting, right? I mean, this is actually uh, something that we've, we've been dealing with for years at the agency. I find it kind of plays the industry a little bit. I mean, do you have any thoughts um, or just tips on, you know, post-proposal or any way that you can kind of combat that, right? The fact that again, yeah. like, you send a proposal and then the people don't even answer emails or phone calls on the way back. Um, yep. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So, so there are two strategies that I use for that. Um, and actually the main one, the main uh, solution for this problem is changing up your process earlier is changing up your earlier process. So I teach um, uh, the, the sales framework that I teach agencies, I call it the DSSP framework and it stands for discovery call strategy call scope proposal. Um, and, uh, and so you're doing an initial discovery call, qualifying them. Are they a good fit? Letting them get to know you a little bit, scheduling another meeting from that, uh, bam, bam, book a meeting from a meeting, schedule a, a longer call three to five days out. So you have time to dig into their, um, uh, dig into their metrics, you know, their performance or competitors, et cetera, really get a feel for what's going on. So you can talk intelligently with them about it, mm -hmm. um, about, about their own business. Um, and then, and, and a lot of people, do the discovery call and then go and do that research and send a proposal without actually ever talking to the prospect again. Completely wrong. You have to talk to them again. You have to get deeper with them, build their, especially now build their trust that you know what you're talking about. You can deliver results for them specifically. Um, and then after that call, before you send a proposal, tell them you're going to send a proposal, but you're also going to send them a recap. That's the scope. Send them an email. This is what we talked about. This is, you know, th these are all the things that looks like you need. Here's what our, you know, our pricing for this looks like. Let me know if that looks good and I can send a proposal. They reply, if, if they don't reply or they, they're like, ah, actually, can we add in this thing? Can we take that thing away? We're not convinced we need that. Great. You know, you kind of have that conversation. And then and only then do you send that proposal. Um, 
And so what you're doing there is you're getting that micro commitment from them, right? They're saying yes. And if you propose, and then you, and then the key here is you propose to them exactly what they just said yes to. You don't try to upsell them. You don't change pricing, anything like that. People ghost because you're putting in things that aren't uh, relevant to their business, things that they haven't even said that they wanted, but you thought that they might need, save that for later. And then, or sticker shock, right? Because they didn't know what to expect and they receive it. And they're like, holy hell, 7,500 bucks. I was expecting like, two grand, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to respond because they're, they're, they're trying to be nice. They don't want to tell you no. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, getting all that out of the way ahead of time will cut down your ghosting dramatically and improve your, your close rates, um, significantly. And just that one step, the second S the scope email. Oh my God, just add that in. And it changes everything. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. The other way to do it though, is to say like, Hey, I'm going to send you, I'm going to get you a proposal by this date. I would love to have a call to discuss that, right? So I'm going to send it to you on Wednesday. How does the next Monday at, you know, I have next Monday at 10 a.m., you know, open your time. How does that work for a follow-up call after the proposal, right? Once again, bam, bam, book a meeting from a meeting. They may still ghost, um, especially if they've gotten sticker shock or something like that. Um, but hopefully you've built enough. The, the goal is you've built enough trust by this point that they're not going to ghost you. They're actually going to have that conversation and you can work towards the right solution for them if there is something in there that was a little bit off. So yeah. I would try those two things right there. Yeah, those are good points. I, I, I would agree with you on that. <clears throat> we've been, we've been testing with stuff too. Um, and I, I agree with you. It's all about moving stuff upstream. Um, more questions up front before they can even book a call about, you know, when they're ready to start the campaign, uh, getting the budget stuff out of the way up front. And then uh, they schedule a consultation with either myself or our, our director of SEO. Uh, and during that call, we have a very set basically a very set plan of the things that we want to cover with them. Number one is I'll talk about them. The first 15 minutes is I'll talk about them, understanding what they're doing. Uh, but then while that that's happening, we're listening and we're trying to map that to what we do. So we've got a deck that's kind of basically full of a lot of deliverables that we've done for clients in the past that we're actually mm -hmm. showing the client. So if they're like, uh, you know, talking about how they can't get links, we'll actually show them a link building strategy that we've done for some of their client before in the past. And we try and prepare that up front a little bit too. And then to your point too, at the end of that call, um, we have enough information to give them somewhat of a price range. So we'll tell them that price range so what they can expect. And then we'll tell them that they can expect a proposal and also pricing black document, et cetera. But we make sure to get on their calendar for that follow-up call within the next four business days. Yeah. Um, and that way we won't, we literally will not work on a proposal now because it takes so much effort to work on a proposal until they've booked and they've responded to an email before that, because this is, this is for, for whatever reason, uh, ghosting is, is very, uh, very common actually. I mean, it, 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 it used to happen to us quite a bit. Um, but again, I think if, to your point, if you can get upstream with a lot of these problems ahead of time, um, then it, it, it just saves you a lot of time in the back end because yeah. once you work yeah. on that proposal, that takes hours and hours and hours. It does. It does, man. Yeah. And, and there's nothing worse than spending that time. And then like, you never even hear any feedback about it, about what you can improve for next time. Yeah. It, it's funny. Ghosting is actually such like a common thing um, that we have. So within Credo, we have uh, uh, agencies can update the status of the, the projects that we send them. So they have kind of a project view. They can update the status. And one of them is ghosted. <laughs> Literally it's ghosted because like it's, it's good for them to know as well that like, Hey, we did a bunch of things and then we just never heard back from them right so it's yeah. different it's different from lost because they might ghost and then come back yeah. um it's rare but it happens um the one thing i would say there ryan is the reason i like the two calls instead of one call is because you're investing less time up front uh on people that might be not qualified um right. and if you're, if you're a good salesperson you're gonna be able to identify that pretty quickly um and you just be like you know you have an hour scheduled, but with if within 10 minutes, you know, it's not going to be a good fit. Good salespeople know how to get them off the phone be like, you know what? Like, I, I actually don't think we're going to be a good fit. I want to save your time. I want to save my time. I don't think we're a good fit because of X, Y, and Z. Happy to refer you to somebody else, but you know, we're not going to be a good fit for you. People appreciate that. Um, so I actually like to do a 15 to 20 minute kind of upfront kind of triaging the quality of the, of the lead. Um, because if you add in too many like form fields and ask for too much information, you know, up front, yeah, they're going to be more qualified, but you're probably also going to lose some good people, right? So I would. So there's definitely a balancing act there. You're going to have to play with that, um, what information you ask for, where, um, but then having a, a very a clear way to get it uh, to to get to know them a little bit up front. It's kind of an intro call, and then having that time to go away and do the deeper call. So you're actually not investing any time up front because it might be a great lead, right? It looks like a great lead on the tin, the things that they need, the budget, the type of company, et cetera. But you hop on and the point of contact is a total asshole. And you're yeah. like, I don't want to work with them, right? Now you've invested two hours of your time up front, you know, looking at this stuff and you hop on and you would have learned in 10 minutes that they actually weren't a good fit. 
Um, so that, that's why I built it the way that I have, but it sounds like your process works, works well also. We, we've, we've also, we've, we've scoped down in terms of the type of client. We don't want to do enterprise. So I used to, Mm. I don't know if you know this, but I recently bought back the rights to my, to my old agency that I had sold to this other company from the future. Um, and after going, yeah, you didn't know that? No. Oh yeah. It's been about six months now. Um, okay. Cool. Yeah, no, I, not, not that I expect. I, I don't talk about it publicly for a lot of reasons. Yeah, sure. um, but point is that after going through that, I realized that I didn't want to do, I didn't want to work with enterprise clients anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, it's too much work <laughs> and it's, it's <laughs> easy to chase, even though they want to pay you like 25 grand a month, like the level yeah. of expertise that you have to have in house at every position is absurd. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. much more yeah. pro- we, we want, we want prefer that kind of large, small to mid size, mid market business that, you know, making anywhere between one in one in 10 million year in revenue, um, understands yeah. the value of SEO and is ready on the phone to make the decision. We do a lot of marketing too. So like we want mm-hmm. people to come to us understanding exactly who we are, the value. I mean, um, you know, all that stuff. Right. So we've really scoped down to like our, our, our target client is four to 5,000 a month. Um, only for our retainer. We charge additional for, for link building and content writing if, if they want that, but we'll handle the link strategy and content strategy, et cetera. Um, but yeah, we've, we've really dialed in our process. And I think that's important for agencies, agencies too, is to understand who their core client is and understand what sales process maps to that. Because if you do want to go enterprise, you can't use my sales process because I'm trying to close no. my two calls. Yeah. Um, right. and, and that's fair. And if you're a small business too, it's a, it's a different sales process. So you've got to understand who, who's on the other line, in the other line of the phone yep. Uh, yep. and you know, understand what their needs are. And also too, if they, if they are not the decision maker, because a lot of the times when you work with enterprise, like you're going to get a marketing manager on the phone who's got to run it all the way up the ladder. Um, right. And that's going to take upwards of six months to close one of those contracts. So you're yep. going to have to yep. have a lot more conversations to your point, probably way more than two phone calls uh, to close an enterprise totally. deal. So it's important. And your marketing and your website needs to speak to that as well, right? As part of why I teach in the accelerator, talking about I, the very first week is talking all about your agency website. The second week is talking about messaging and positioning because so many, especially in the SEO world, just get that wrong. We look at like, like I have, I have a keyword research pulled up here. I've been doing some for, for Credo recently and we're like, oh, well that, you know, that one's a good fit. And oh, look at that volume. Yeah, I can, you know, I can, yeah, I can create that page and rank it, but mm. you're not actually thinking about like, who's the person behind that. That's, you know, that's looking at it, right. Thinking through the funnel, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel. Um, and also based off the persona, what are, what are the keywords in those different parts of the funnel for that specific type of person who you are, what you do, who you do it for is what you need to be messaging on your site because you don't want people coming and being like, well, I'm a, I'm tiny, right. I'm a brand new startup looking to launch and look again, SEO strategy put together. Is this a good fit for me? Right. They should be able to tell, like, actually, no, because you're a SaaS company and you're just getting started. They, they work with you know, e-commerce companies doing between one and $10 million a year that, that have already done a bit of SEO that are looking to invest more into it, right? Nope, yeah. not a fit for me. And that's totally fine because you don't want to talk to those people anyway, so you're just going to waste your time. Um, so yeah, you're, you're, completely, you're completely right there. Um, and, and with these different levels, you kind of need to learn like who, uh, I mean, it, it's the, yeah, who, who you are, what you do, who you do it for. You should know who you are what your team looks like, that kind of thing, what your culture is, what you do, you know, if you do all the things, do you, do you do any of them really well? What are the things that you're best at? Um, and then finally, who you do it for. And that's, that's, I mean, some of it's experience, right? We've all worked with the tiny ones and the big ones and the, and the medium sized ones. A lot of us come back to the medium sized ones, those three to five K a month retainers, man, those things yeah. can build a freaking awesome business. You can drive yeah. great results for them. You can grow them, um, you know, and, and they're going to be super grateful. They're going to refer other people just like that to you much harder on the enterprise side and the little ones, you know, the, the ones that are paying you the least are always going to take the most work. Yeah. So I, I love, I love that middle man that like, I say 750 K to 5 million. Like I, I love that stage of business yeah. and the people that are working with those kinds of businesses. Yeah. Ag- agreed hundred percent. I, I think the expectation to like a lot of the time, like when you're working with an enterprise client, they've got like that marketing manager who's literally heard most, most, most at enterprise companies that the role of a marketing manager is mainly to manage agencies. I used to work at Sapien Nitro. So I understand like there was always somebody um, in, you know, most of the clients that, their job was to be like the agency ringer. You know what I'm saying? They have expectations for communication every day, phone calls, like all that stuff that again is great. It's not, it's not necessarily overly hard to deliver, but from an operational point of view, trying to scale that model, like you need a lot of really smart people um, who can communicate. People are expensive. They have deep backgrounds, that kind of thing. I was an in-house marketing manager, man. I know I've, I've seen it from both sides. Like, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's a different, it's a different world for sure. Um, you know, it, when I worked for distilled in New York, 2011 to 2013, um, which I, I love, it was a phenomenal time in life. Um, we talked about ourselves as, uh, as, uh, SEO management consultants, 
Mm -hmm. um, because that was the level of consulting that we were doing. Like I was yeah. running the SEO strategy for IHG, Holiday Inn's parent company, right? Nice. Uh, alongside their team. I was their consultant. I was on calls with them three times a week. Like I was, I was an integrated part of their team, but I came out of the consulting world yeah. and customer success world. Um, so like I knew how to do that sort of stuff, but people that came in, they're just talking about links and, you know, keyword research and that sort of stuff struggled on that. Yeah. They're great individual contributors, but as an agency owner, you can't really put them in front of a, in front of a client. Yeah, absolutely. And you can, you can really only learn those skills that you just mentioned from doing it. Like you can yeah. learn link building and keyword research from YouTube, but sure. going through and understanding you know, just how to have a conversation with a pissed off client, you know, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. is of incredibly valuable skill set, incredibly valuable skill or set. How to get buy-in up, up the chain, right? I was getting buy-in from like VPs at IHG to invest multiple six figures into content, right? Yeah. Like if you're, if you're not experienced in doing that and working, working up the chain, you come to agreement here, then you go here, then you go here, then you have a pitch. It's like, if you don't know how those steps work, you're just not, you're just not going to be able to get it done. It's going to be hard. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and this kind of segues nicely. And you mentioned earlier about um, pricing and, and, and charging what you're worth. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a few, there's a few parts to it. Number one is, you know, a, a lot of people ask me like, well, what are, what are kind of the average rates? Right. And I have a whole like pricing survey that I did about like how much do SEO consultants, SEO agencies charge based off of, you know, services they offer parts of the world, all that sort of stuff. So like, it's, it's good to know that kind of thing and be able to benchmark yourself. And if you're just getting started, that's good to, you know, good to understand. Um, but really what it comes down to is uh, the, the type of offering that you're, that you're, uh, that you're, the, the type of thing you're offering, right consulting services, that sort of stuff. They all have kind of different prices. The kind of company that you are, uh, the kinds of companies that you're working towards, what do they expect to pay and what is it worth to their business? Um, and then finally, and, and then based off of what it's worth to their business, then you can get to the value. So uh, kind of a, an, a, an equation that I like to use is, and, and then also based off of your experience, right? There are kind of some multipliers in there that if you've been working with, you know, say, you, say you're, you're doing e-commerce SEO, and you founded an e-commerce company and you did all the SEO and then you hired an SEO agency and then you started your own SEO agency to work with e-commerce companies, you should be able to charge more than someone that's just been an agency person their whole life has never owned an e-commerce company, right? So it was like a 1.3 to 1.5X kind of multiplier on that off your pricing. Um, and then also like the name that you have, the, um, you know, the profile that you have in the industry, all of that. If you're a, you know, uh, Neil Patel can charge a ton of money because he's Neil Patel, right? Mm -hmm. Like someone else could do better work than Neil, but not be nearly as well known as him. And they're not gonna be able to charge nearly as much because they don't have that name. So, you know, that purpose of branding and blogging and social and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, I, I like to credit Twitter for a lot of my success, <laughs> mm -hmm. honestly. Um, but when it comes to, when it comes to pricing, you know, understanding what are, what are other people kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, charging in your space is a place to start, but then what are they, what are they looking for? Ultimately, what are the results that the client is looking to achieve working back from there? What are they, um, uh, you know, so say they want to go from a million to 5 million in two years using just SEO content and link building. Right. So it's a big stretch, right? So like what team do they have in place, all that sort of thing. But if you can add 4 million in revenue per month to them, right? Like, they should be willing to pay you a decent chunk of that, right? I yeah. usually say it should be around 10% that they should be they should be paying you, right? If we're talking advertising, what's a good ROAS? Three to one, four yeah. to one? Like what about a 10 to one return, right? And when you, when you mention that, they're like, oh yeah, that actually, that actually makes sense. Like if you can deliver on adding a million dollars in revenue to us every single month, why would we not pay you a hundred grand for that work, right? Um, so, so, so do you suggest and when it comes to different pricing, pricing methods and models, mm -hmm. are you saying that people should be doing some sort of variable pricing on top of their fee? I mean, or, or just even before that too, before you answer yeah. that, I guess, how do you suggest, what, what, what is your preferred method for pricing? Is it based on hourly? Is it based on deliverables? Is it based on value base, which it sounds like you were kind of getting into there? Is it based on percentage of sales? Like, how do you recommend that agency price, price their services? I've done it all. And I would say that 98% of agencies should do value-based pricing. Um, do not do so, some combination of value-based pricing and like hourly times number of hours plus a, what I call the pain in the ass tax. Mm -hmm. um, so, which is really just overhead um, yeah. and, and overage. Um, so 
uh, value-based pricing based off of how much, you know, what, what are their goals? What's it going to take to get there? And then, you know, how much is this work ultimately going to be worth to them? Assuming that you can help them, you know, hit their goals. If you don't think you can help them hit their goals, you shouldn't be pitching the work, right? Or right. you should kind of dial back, um, you know, what it is that you're charging them. Um, so you're not gouging them. Um, but really don't pitch the work. Um, hourly is bad because it, it does not align incentives. Um, you know, when I hire contractors and I hire freelancers, that kind of thing, I basically commit to a certain number of hours. I'm like, I think this amount of work is going to take this number of hours. Do you agree? Okay, cool. Here's your hourly rate. So we're going to pay you X. If we go over that, tell me when we're getting to that. If we go over that, then I'll pay you per hour. But I also pay them at like their hourly rate times and add on about another 25%, right? Because they were, you know, they, uh, yeah, they, they've, you know, they've been loyal to me and then, you know, basically helping them keep their, uh, you know, keep the lights on, right? Hourly billing is really hard as a provider because if you don't agree to a certain like minimum of hours, which if you agree to a certain minimum of hours, that's basically a retainer, just, uh, just message, just kind of packaged in a more like palliative way. Um, so definitely do that. Um, but, you know, if you, if you, if you're like, yeah, we'll do work for you at 150 bucks an hour, some months they are going to need you for 30 hours. Other months they're going to need you for four. Your income is wildly different. And then you also don't know how much work you're able to sell. So you oversell everything and you're constantly asking, constantly doing sales again to your existing clients. What do you need this month? Right. Or, Hey, do you have more hours this month? That kind of thing. It's very mm -hmm. hand to mouth. It's hard to predict. Um, I, do not recommend that agencies work off of SEO agencies work off of a percentage of upside. Um, clients that want that tend to be cheap yeah. um, and they're probably going to F you over. Um, plus attribution is super, super hard, right? They'll, they'll like, they'll, they'll dispute everything and you're never going to get paid what you think you're going to get paid. I've yeah. never seen it work out. Not one time. Um, so I, I tell people don't do it. I've never agreed to it. I'm really glad that I haven't, you know, I've had like options in private companies and such before it's worth $0 to me until there's a, a, a you know, a liquidity event. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't base, um, you know, your income off of also the other, something that other people are doing that's going to make it so that you can get paid. Um, so, you know, the, the, um, the other way to do it, of course, the most common way to do it, I mean, value-based or like hourly times number of hours you think it's going to take. Plus I usually add on somewhere between 10 and 20%, depending on how expensive the project is and what I know that they're willing to pay um, for basically overages for management. Um, you know, if they need extra communication, say they become like a super, like they're awesome in the sales process. This happens too often. They're awesome in the sales process. And then once they're actually paying you money, they like, they want to be on a call every day, all that kind of thing. Part of that is you didn't set expectations ahead of time, but also if they need that amount of handholding, they should be paying you for that, right? So making it clear ahead of time, this is how often we're going to communicate. You can reach me by email anytime. I respond within 24 hours. We do weekly calls on Tuesdays at 2 p.m., that kind of thing. And sometimes they'll be like, oh, well, can we do a call every day? Oh, you wanted that one? Like, yeah, we can mm -hmm. do that, but we price that at this, right? So you're not telling them no. You're just making it so that they're understanding that like, hey, other calls, like extra calls is time, right? And they need to be paying for that time. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's kind of how I, how I build that. And I love retainers. Retainers are so nice because, you know, you know what you're going to make, you know, what's required of you every month. Um, you have to tell them, you have to give them that clarity about what they're going to get every month for what they're paying you. Um, but you have that consistent income. And if you get them to agree to like a six month, uh, you know, retainer, right. And they know what they're going to get every single month that then allows enough time. You basically get rid of the people that just try it on people. Right. Mm -hmm. And you get the people, the people willing to commit to that. They're going to be seeing results after six months time. Right. Um, because SEO does take that amount of time. So, so, so a, a few follow-ups here. Um, yeah. So you're distinguishing retainer as different than hourly. It sounds like you're classifying hourly as how an attorney would classify hourly, right? Yes. yes. So, which by the way, did you know an attorney will charge you for an hour of their time if you take more than six minutes of their time in an hour? Yeah, I didn't know that. I found out the hard <laughs> It's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, um, more of us need to do that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I technically that's how I do it too because I, I I used to do hour long consulting calls, and if they ran short, mm. then I would be like, you're, you're paying me for an hour. You're not paying me for like yeah, for. Sure. 32 yeah. minutes. Anyways. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I, we work on an hourly model, but it's not hourly the way that you described it. It's hourly based on two things. Number one, like I said, is that, and I know you'll probably disagree with me on this, but we're running the same SEO campaign, no matter what, meaning we have a base project plan that we use. We're altering it based. If it's e-commerce, then it's going to be more cute research, more on page because there's more product pages, right? But if it's B2B, 
50 page website. We're not going to spend that much time doing cute research on like their, their bottom funnel pages and on page 10 hours tops. And then we're going to shift our focus to content and keyword research for content and building content. So in a sense, we'll kind of just shift those hours either top or bottom if it's e-com, but we're really running the same thing. We're running the same audits. Um, we've built them all in house, blah, 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 whatever. We know how long these audits take us to run. We know how long it takes to do keyword research based on number of pages. So what I'm doing is we put together a spreadsheet. That's basically a matrix that says tech plus SEO, keyword research on page content strategy, link, uh, link outreach, analytics, project management, and then consulting too, if they want to talk on the phone. Um, and what we do is we quote them on a number of hours each month over 12 months. So we only work on 12 month mm -hmm. campaigns. And then at the bottom of the spreadsheet, it sums up the number of hours times we're 200 an hour. And then we average that over 12 because to your point the, the work ebbs and ebbs and flows very seriously, um, very yeah. significantly. So I tell them at that point too, I say, look, we use hours to justify what our monthly retainer is. We're showing you these hours. Mm -hmm. Um, so you understand why we're charging you five grand for a technical audit, not just like a value based audit. Right. And then that's the end of the hours conversation. We don't bill for hours. They get, they get an invoice every month for, there's no yeah. hours mentioned on it. But I tell them that like, we may go over, we, we may go under, but I literally tell them like, this is the end of the hours discussion. We track them internally for operational purposes. So we know how these, et cetera. So yep. I guess we're more of like an hourly retainer. It just means you run a good agency because you're tracking yeah. hours, you know what people's time is going towards. Exactly. So, so I, I guess we would probably fall under the retainer model, but we do use hours. We do discuss the hours up front. I just, I just find them, this is just my opinion that some people want to want to see want to see how you arrive at your retainers, and this is my issue with value based. Yep. So value based to me, it's kind of a I don't actually I shouldn't say issue because I know somebody I don't know if you know Chris Dreyer he runs um, a legal SEO agency. They they I only the work name. with P, yeah they only do PI attorneys. They're doing about four million a year in revenue off of twenty clients, <laughs> and it's all value based because right. they know exactly how much value they can add to a PI attorney. But he's got that mm -hmm. shit dialed. You know he's got it dialed. Right. Um, so my concern with value base is almost kind of like, you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of like going through this building a house process, you realize how very similar we are to the to general contracting, right? Yeah. It'd be like if, if you went to a general contract and be like, I want you to build a house, but I'm going to pay you after I sell it based on how much more we sell it for. The contract is going to yeah. be like, dude, there's hard costs that go in. Like I have to pay people for their time, right. just like an agency does. Right, right. To, yeah, do, yeah. to do all the work. Um, yeah. So that's why I agree with you that I would never take a percentage of sales because it's 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 just a bullshit model in my opinion. Yeah, um, it, is. it is, I agree. But value-based, like how do you arrive at the value? Are you looking at like the potential keyword value? And then, so for example, like let's say you want to work with an attorney and you're like, all right, it's going to be 10 grand a month because I know what the keyword value is. But like if they have no keyword rankings, like how do you, right. like how long, like how you just be like 10 grand a month and then they're expecting that too. Like they're expecting to get right. to that level of value. What if you don't, right? right? Is that like, how do you, how do you, like, how do you kind of work through that thought process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and this is why, like, I mean, I, I do both. I've, I've done both multiple times. Um, and, uh, you know, and actually uh, to your point about the like basically selling number of hours, that's basically a package, right? So retainer right. with like number of hours, these are the things that we're going to do. Credo's best agency does it that way. You want to pay this, you get this many hours. You want to pay this, you get this many hours, right? And they also mm -hmm. have certain kickers or certain like um, multipliers based off of number of channels and extra like, uh, you know, work that that's going to take that kind of thing. I like rubrics like yours where you're like, you need X, Y, and Z. You don't need this thing, but you need these other mm -hmm. things. And so boom, this all comes together. This is how much it takes because we run this process for everybody times $200 an hour. And there you go. Um, so I actually really do like that model um, and it works really well. It's really easy to sell. The value-based yeah. one is harder is harder to sell. Um, so I, I probably overstated myself that most should be running uh, value-based. I would say either value-based or the kind of thing that you do, re just retainers like that, um, because you do have those fixed costs. The value-based ones, I would say that is for uh, clients that, you know, they're not a brand new PI attorney, right? They're a PI attorney. They've been around for 20 years. They have X keyword rankings and they're looking to go from, you know, 50 leads a month to 150 leads a month and they close at X percentage and the average project is worth Y, mm -hmm. right? And then you're like, okay, so if we can get you, even we, you know, even we only get you another hundred, right? Or another 50. So you get to a hundred, that's still going to be worth $1.5 million, right? Mm -hmm. So over the course of a year, you know, like $1.5 million additional. So, you know, uh, over 12 months, uh, or so 10% of that is, you know, 150K, divide that by 12, and then, you know, sandbag yourself a little bit, you know, based off of like, uh, you know, your cost and that kind of thing. It's gonna be 10 grand a month. We're gonna do X, Y, and Z, and our goal is to get you to this many, you know, this yeah. many leads. 
Um, so, so I think we're arriving at the same thing, just in slightly different ways. Um, but um, yeah, if, if they have established metrics, right, and they have goals that they're trying to hit, because we've all had those people come to us, then some of them turn out being great clients, but they're like, we don't know what our goals are. We don't know what's possible, right? Yeah. In that case, I just sell them like a strategy and, and competitor research and that sort of project. So then they understand. So then they'll actually pay you what, you what they should pay you to reach their goals. And they're also not coming to you with like, we're at 10,000 visits a month. We want to go to a, you know, a million visits a month and we need it within four months. Not yeah. going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, probably. And I, and I, th- I feel like that, that I agree, we're, we're arriving kind of the same middle point, just from different, like you're, you're, you're extracting the value from the campaign, which I actually think is easier to, it, it's a harder sell, but it's an easier kind of attention grab to be like, Hey, you're going to make 1.5 potentially right. just based on the data that we found. Right. right, um, right. And also to, 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 to kind of like what I talk about a lot in the blueprint is, so I teach the model that I just, that I just told you. And I mm-hmm. tell folks that to me, the value is in your hourly rate. Like you're based, like the goal is to increase your hourly rate. Like I want to get up to $500 an hour eventually. You know what I mean? But like that to me is like, we're increasing our prices based on the value of what our, our time is per hour. Right. Which is also derived mm-hmm. from the value we drive for clients, but also to your point, which I think is huge that not enough folks talk about like the perceived value of your brand, right? The value right. of your content, the value of your mm-hmm. case studies, the value of your referrals, yeah the value of the, the logos that you've worked with in the past, all that, yep. to me, that's what makes up your, your, the value of, of ultimately what you're charging, which is your hourly rate. The hours are just, it's just an operational model to make sure that we're profitable, yep. you know, yep. Yep. Um, yep. based off that. And honestly, like you telling me that you guys charge $200 an hour, <laughs> that surprises me. You should be charging more. Um, you know, I, and the, the way I tell agencies to raise their prices is, you know, you had one client that came in and you quoted them at $200 an hour or one prospect, right? They're not, clients are paying you, prospects are people you're trying to sell. Um, the next one, do it at 210. Yeah. They don't know you quoted the previous person at 200. If they sign at 210, multiple people sign at 210, go to 220, right? Keep on working up until basically the value that you're bringing, the people that you're trying to sell aren't seeing the value in that. True. Um, then you know where your ceiling is and then you need to add on other things in order to get to that 300, 500, or just, you know, as you're doing your own marketing, you're speaking, you're, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, um, then you're, uh, uh, you know, you can keep charging, you know, based off of that. Um, or you can just say like, you know, we raise our prices 5% every year um, because of cost of living and inflation. Yeah, good points, good points. I really argue with that. Good point. So we're just about out of time. Um, is there anything else that, that you want to talk about that we didn't get around to? Oh man, anything else that I want to talk about that we didn't, that we didn't get around to? How long do we have? Um, I'm kidding. Uh, so I would, I would say that, when it comes to building to building an agency, so I mean, full disclosure, I've not built an agency myself. I've worked for multiple agencies. I was a solo consultant. I basically bootstrap credo by my own SEO consulting um, and then working with, you know, 300, 300 plus agencies um, over the last few years. Um, the, the issues that I see happen with, with agencies is, um, first of all, they're not clear about what they do and who they do it for. They're trying to message all the things. They're trying to rank for SEO services. You don't want to freaking rank for SEO services. Those leads are going to be crap. They're going to be awful. Um, so really focus down on who it is that you're serving and what you offer to them. Double down on those testimonials, case studies, video, like that sort of stuff. That's how you're going to convert these leads that you actually want to, uh, that, that you actually want to convert. You're going to get them to contact you and then they're actually going to know what to expect and you're going to have a decent chance at closing them. Um, so I would say that is the biggest thing, especially in the SEO world. Quit talking about fucking backlinks. Talk about business impact. Like I, I beat this hammer all the time. People get mad at me about it, but we're an industry of individual contributors. We need to be an industry of, and there's nothing wrong with individual contributors. I love individual contributors, but if you're trying to sell work to clients and you're trying to actually charge what it's worth, you're ultimately driving business impact. So you need to think like a business person, not like an SEO. Um, and I see a lot of SEO agencies that they're just talking about, you know, blog posts and infographics and, and backlinking, right? Which I hate that term when actually you need to be talking about like, what are your goals? Start, for, start from the other side. That's how you get there. But what is it you're ultimately trying to accomplish, right? Um, and, you know, there's a million SEO, SEO strategies out there, a million, you know, linking strategies, a million content strategies. You can produce big pieces, small pieces. You can, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that you can do. What matters is that what you do is able to drive the results. So you need to be speaking to the results um, and, and how you've helped other companies get there. Ultimately, that is how you're going to grow. That's how you're going to grow your agency. Um, 
when it comes to lead generation. And then of course, there's so much on the back end of, you know, operating profitably and, uh, you know, hiring the right people, retaining the right people, training the right people, processes for delivering, you know, value, all that sort of stuff. And all that has to come along with it, you know, as well. Um, it, it's, I, I find it unfortunate when agencies and, and stuff happens in business, right? Key person leaves. And so because they leave this client that you just signed, right? Like that, that project just goes sideways from the start because the person that was supposed to be working on it had something happen and they decided not to come back to work. Right. I see that happen. Um, but you know, uh, setting in place those processes, um, and actually marching towards business results and helping your clients realize that you're getting them business results, not just building them links and writing blog posts, um, is, is ultimately going to be the way that you, that, that you level up and that the industry levels up. Um, and we're able to basically charge what we should be charging for the value that we're bringing. Um, and, and, and I think that's, and rising tides lift all ships, right? The more people that can be doing that the better the industry is going to be, is going to be overall, right? You're not going to get the, I had a big publicly traded company come to me that they just let it go up their SEO agency and they're looking to hire a freelancer to do SEO and web development. I was like, good luck with that on their like, I mean, massive company. And they wanted to pay $2,000 a month. And I was like, can you tell me how much money you're making from SEO right now? And they went and they looked, it was like 45% of their revenue based off of their Google analytics was from organic. I was like, this is like probably close to a billion dollar a year revenue company. I was like, and you're, you're looking to spend two grand on sure. SEO, like something, something's wrong here, you know? And I, I was just straight up with them. I was honest with them and they ended up signing with someone for like six. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was, uh, uh, but you know, a lot of people have just been like, okay, cool. I'll sell you an engagement for two grand a month. Right. When they should yeah. be charging a lot more than that. For sure. So that, that's my, that's my rant right there about the, the SEO industry. We need to be business people, not SEOs. Well said, well put. Uh, tell the people where they can find you at John. Yeah, best place to find me. Uh, so I'm on Twitter way too much, Doherty J-F, D-O-H-E-R-T-Y-J-F. Um, and then the, the website is getcredo.com, G-E-T-C-R-E-D-O.com. Awesome. All right, man, we appreciate your time. Thank you for stopping by, dropping some knowledge for us. And uh, I'll see you on Twitter, dude. My pleasure, Ryan. See you around. All right, brother, take care. Yep, bye.